Jingle Google, Jingle Classroom, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to do another e-learning lesson today. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Snow Day number two. Broadcasting once again from the underground snow bunker. Just got done shoveling the ultramontanism off my blessed P.O. Nono. If you don't know what that means, stick around for the e-lesson. It still won't make sense, but you'll know why it doesn't make sense. All right, so yesterday we talked a little bit about the fallout from the French Revolution and the church's opposition to political liberalism, especially with Pope Gregory XVI's Mirari Voss, which is um, encyclical from 1832. Uh, so Gregory XVI was succeeded in 1846 by Blessed Pope Pius IX, also known affectionately as Blessed Pio Nono. I believe that's the Italian way of saying it. Uh, Pius was originally sympathetic towards political liberalism. In fact, people were shocked when he became Pope. How could a liberal become Pope? Whoa, it's a big deal, especially after Gregory the Sixteenth. Um, everything changed for Pius the Ninth. My son just fell down upstairs. That's why you hear a baby crying. Um, everything changed for Pius the Ninth when. Uh, revolutionaries wanted him to start a war with another Catholic king, and he's like, you know, the optics of a pope going to war against a Catholic king probably wouldn't be very good. Uh, so he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, at which point the revolutionaries turned against Pius. They invaded and took over the papal states. They murdered the prime minister of the papal states. Then they stormed Rome and forced Pius IX to flee the city. Okay. Uh, from there on out, Pius was a little bit wary of the political revolutionaries. All right, uh, So he spends the next couple of decades fighting against liberalism. Um, he actually issues what's called the Syllabus of Errors. This was attached to a uh, papal encyclical. Um, but the syllabus basically uh, outlined a series of errors that he's condemning, all right? So it's basically a list of propositions condemning certain things, okay? Uh, so the Syllabus of Errors was published in 1864, 32 years after Mirari Voss, following much in the footsteps of uh, Mirari Voss. Condemns political liberalism, but also socialism, uh, as well as communism. We'll talk about Karl Marx tomorrow. Naturalism is a form of atheism, uh, and then enlightenment rationalism, separation of church and state, all kinds of things like that, okay? All right, so there is your blessed Pio Nono uh, and the Syllabus of Errors, okay? Uh, don't worry, I will show you the second half of that as well, okay? Um, Ultramontanism, which is another thing I mentioned in my cold open, was uh, a movement that began in the church, um, which looked to the Pope as a centralized figure of authority. Okay, uh, Ultramontanism literally means over the mountains. Okay, This is referring to the Alps uh, in France, uh, that'd be what, Eastern France, Switzerland, and Northern Italy. All right. So this started with uh, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Empire basically eroding church leadership at the local level. All right, so as you've got bishops and priests who are essentially uh, secular moderns or non-existent at all, right, uh, or they're working for the state, uh, people start to look beyond their local leaders all the way to the Pope for effective uh, defense and leadership against modernism, against this liberalism, okay? So... More than ever, the Pope is being depended upon for centralized leadership and support in defense of the church. All right. That's kind of the core of this ultramontanist movement. Um, this began really with Pope Pius VII taking a stand against Napoleon. All right. People were inspired by that. Uh, Gregory XVI with Mirari Voss is continuing that. Uh, and then after that, you get Pius IX. Now, Pius IX strengthens this ultramontanist movement when he defines the Immaculate Conception of Mary in 1854. Okay, he formally <clears throat> formally defines that dogma by his own authority as Pope, which is a pretty big deal. No council or anything. In fact, he calls the bishops and cardinals to Rome, 
And they sit in the audience while he delivers this definition of this doctrine. Okay. Uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary is the doctrine that from the first moment of her conception, Mary was uh, preserved from inheriting the stain of original sin. Okay. By virtue of the merits uh, of Jesus. Okay. So Jesus, through his uh, sacrifice and resurrection, earned uh, the merits of salvation, merited the grace of salvation. Through that grace which he merited, uh, Mary is preserved ahead of time, free from the stain of sin. Okay, Even though that grace was merited later in time, it's preemptively given to Mary. Kind of crazy, all right? God's outside of time. He can do that kind of stuff. But that's not really the point. The point is that Pius IX defined this formally by his own authority in 1854. Okay. Okay, that's the other part of this. Get that up there. And there we go, a little higher. Okay, pause it if needed. Okay. Now, what that did was it raised questions about papal infallibility. All right. Uh, generally, the church agreed for centuries up to that point that the pope could speak infallibly. But it wasn't defined as to you know what the conditions had to be for him to actually be speaking infallibly. All right. Uh, was it everything he said? Was it very limited? How did that work? Okay. So 15 years later, in 1869, Pius IX opens the first Vatican Council. Okay. This is what we refer to as Vatican I. Opens in 1869. Um, Vatican I issues two dogmatic decrees. Okay, or dogmatic constitutions. All right, the first dogmatic constitution the Vatican I issues is called Dei Filius. Dei Filius. Okay, Dei Filius responds essentially to Enlightenment rationalism. We talked about rationalism, uh, this idea that we can't accept anything as true unless reason alone can prove that it's true reason by itself, without divine revelation, human experience, or anything like that, okay? Um, so rationalism places reason above faith, okay? The content of faith is judged by pure reason. So what De Filius did was declare that reason and nature are actually subordinate to or below the order of grace and faith. My son just fell down again. He does that quite a bit. He'll throw himself down, hit his head on the floor, and then cry about it. He's okay. Don't worry about him. Okay, so De Filius, nature and reason are below grace and faith. But reason and faith are also complementary. Okay? They help each other out. Um, okay, so the reasoning behind this is faith is based on God's revelation to man. Okay, God is all-knowing, and he is ultimate truth. He is truth itself. Therefore, God is incapable of lying. Okay, So whatever God reveals must be true by virtue of the fact that it's God who is revealing it. All right? So because of that, the content of faith is more certain than anything we could possibly conclude from reason alone. All right? uh, with human reason, conclusions reached just by human reason, there's always an element of uncertainty. Right? You see this in... Uh, the history of philosophy, where it's like people coming to all kinds of completely contradictory conclusions based on human reason alone. Okay, uh, So faith is more certain than reason because it's based on God revealing the truth to us. Okay, um, But the truth of divine revelation, that is the content of faith, can never truly contradict reason. Okay, Rather, it goes beyond what reason can know by itself in order to enlighten or to illuminate reason, and it completes and perfects the knowledge we have from reason alone. Okay, uh, So faith completes, perfects, illuminates reason. Uh, reason, for its part, helps us to understand the content of divine revelation, helps us to understand our faith more fully. So there's that complementarity there. Okay, A good historical example of this uh, can be seen in our doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, Based on divine revelation, uh, sacred scripture, we believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, But the concepts that we use to describe that, to say that God is three persons, 
uh, in sharing one substance. The, the concepts of persons, uh, personae in Latin, hypostases in Greek, and substance is usia in Greek. Those concepts are actually drawn from Greek philosophy, especially Plato. Okay? In other words, we use human reason to describe that divinely revealed reality that is the Trinity. Okay? All right, so that's De Filius on the relationship between faith and reason. Uh, the second, I suppose I should show you this here as well so you can see just how to spell it if you're taking notes. Okay, there's De Filius. The one beneath it is Pastor Eternus. Okay. Pastor Eternus is the second dogmatic constitution uh, issued by Vatican I. Uh, Pastor Eternus uh, officially defines papal infallibility. Okay. Um, the council says these words. It says, We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman pontiff, the Pope, speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. He possesses by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter that infallibility which the divine redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church, irreformable. Okay, there's a lot there. That's a mouthful. Basically, it's saying the Pope's infallibility is quite limited and three conditions must be met. One, the Pope must be speaking, quote, in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, end quote. <clears throat> okay. In other words, he's not infallible when he's speaking just as a private theologian uh, or as a pastor delivering a homily or when he's giving interviews, okay? Um, and when he's invoking this supreme apostolic authority, he will use language that is clearly invoking that supreme apostolic authority, okay? Um, condition number two, he must be defining a doctrine concerning faith or morals, okay? So in terms of Issues of church discipline, excommunicating people, uh, predicting things about the future, expressing opinions about political candidates, uh, or even making practical moral judgments like calling for a crusade. Those things are never infallible, even when the Pope is doing them. Okay, um, He has to be defining a doctrine concerning faith or morals. All right. Third condition. Uh, he must be defining this doctrine to be held by the whole church. Okay, so he's not infallible if he's only addressing a limited audience, uh, such as a specific person, or a group, or a crowd, or a reporter. Okay, he has to be defining it to be held by the whole church. So Pius IX's uh, definition of the Immaculate Conception is a very good example of the Pope meeting these criteria. Okay, so the words uh, he uses here to define the Immaculate Conception, he says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for the honor of the holy and undivided Trinity, for the glory and adornment of the Virgin Mother of God, for the exaltation of the Catholic faith, and for the furtherance of the Catholic religion. By the authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own. Okay, so there he's invoking this supreme apostolic authority. We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine, then he states the doctrine, of the Immaculate Conception, is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. Okay. So he's clearly defining a doctrine regarding the faith to be held firmly and constantly by all the faithful. Okay. All right, so that's Pastor Eternus, um, the second constitution issued by Vatican I. Vatican I is cut short uh, <clears throat> in 1870 by the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. All right, so its agenda is sort of left incomplete till Vatican II in the 1960s. Uh, so it's a short council, but two very important documents. All right, again, I'll show you this. Ooh, there we go. Okay. All right, so to wrap it up, why are we talking about this? How does this relate to Catholic social teaching? Yada, yada, yada. Okay. 
two, two main things here. So specifically regarding the church's social teaching itself, <coughs> one second. It's melted snow from my front porch. It's not. Okay, specifically regarding the church's social teaching, uh, Pius the Ninth continues the condemnation of political liberalism, right, uh, with a syllabus of errors and other teaching. So he's following the teaching of Gregory the Sixteenth, his predecessor. He's further reinforcing the church's opposition to political revolution, separation of church and state, freedom of conscience, of the press, of education, etc. Um, so he's he's really solidifying the church's opposition to the modern world in a sense. All right. Okay. Secondly, Ultramontanism. Ultramontanism has contributed in a very big way to the development of the church's social teaching. Okay, I'll hold this up real fast. All right, but uh, the vast majority of the church's social teaching has been developed through uh, what's called the papal magisterium, all right, through papal encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, through the church, the pope's teaching authority, all right. Um, this is a, largely a result of the ultramontanist movement. All right, because beginning in the 19th century, that's when the church starts to look to the Pope to answer questions about social issues. Okay, and that begins, you'll see a lot of history books say that begins with uh, Catholic social teaching in the modern sense, really begins with um, Rerum Navarum from Leo, Pope Leo XIII, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but you can trace that all the way back to Mirari Voss with Gregory the Sixteenth. The Church looking to the Pope to answer questions and defend the Church on social issues. Okay, um, so that's a result of Ultramontanism, and that's really why that's what set the set the pattern for us looking to the Pope for leadership on social issues. Okay. Um, all right, that's it. Hopefully, you enjoyed this a little bit. Um, Maybe we'll have a cold weather day tomorrow. We'll see. Or maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Either way. All right. Enjoy the day.